Suppose I open the newspaper and read, Sun rises, 7.35 a.m. Sets, 3.58 p.m. Apart from some misprint or other casual error easily corrected, this information is undoubtedly true and accurate. It is supplied by the Greenwich Observatory. Good sense will prevent me from taking this statement absolutely or physically and making it false. The sun of itself never rises or sets, and even in relation to human observers, it seldom rises so late or sets so early. This, on the sun's part, is an extreme wintry laziness. The proposition is meant to be historical not general or scientific, and like all historical propositions, describing incidental facts, it depends for its truth on its incidence, that is, on fixing the time and place to which it refers, as in this case to London on November 25th, 1935. Nor have we here precise historical truth in psychological terms, telling us what was the experience of particular individuals at particular moments. Probably no Londoner saw the sun rise or set on that 25th of November. If truth were reduced to truths of experience, there would be no truth at all in this matter. All that is meant is that, at that date, the astronomical conditions were such that if there had been no clouds, no fog, and no smoke, the first and last rays of the sun would have struck the London chimney tops at those hours, or would have struck the eyes of any cockney, then looking in the requisite direction from his attic window. A certain and accurate truth may thus be conveyed in conventional terms which in themselves are loose and inaccurate. Implications as to what has happened physically, and hypotheses as to what might have happened psychologically, may be placed before the human mind by a figure of speech that will not bear pressing yet is unequivocal enough for human purposes. Almost all the knowledge we have of nature and of history visits our minds in this conventional form, clothed in metaphors and idioms proper to our grammar, and not seriously misleading our action or expectation, but leaving us in ignorance or in childish illusion about the proper texture of the facts. The animal vision of the universe is, in one sense, never false. It is rooted in the nature of that animal, aroused to consciousness by the circumstances of the moment. These circumstances, as well as that animal endowment, will therefore be expressed in the vision. And when I say expressed, I do not mean passively betrayed by some quality or detail in this vision, but since consciousness is implied, I mean noted, described, and known in some measure, and in terms no matter how subjective. In a word, the vision claims to be true, and it possesses truth at least in this fundamental respect that it has a real object and is not an idle mental phenomenon. It is true enough to be false and to require correction, for the whole view of mind characteristic of modern philosophy, that mind is a train of self-existing feelings or ideas, is itself false. Mind is spirit wakefulness or attention or moral tension aroused in animals by the stress of life. The prerequisite to the appearance of any feeling or idea is that the animal should be alive and awake, attentive, that is, to what is happening, has happened, or is about to happen, so that it belongs to the essence of discoverable existence, as a contemporary philosophy has it, to be in the world. The observable details, the sounds, lights, darting pains, curious somatic feelings, etc., are not separately given to pure intuition as they might be to a disembodied spirit. They come in and from an imposed and assumed world, an object of concern, alarm, desire, or avid possession, and this material incubus is felt and posited as an incubus, as air is felt and posited in the struggle to breathe not pictorially or ideally, but as a besetting reality. Agony posits it, and sensation or fancy afterwards study and describe it, if they have the leisure. But the greater part of life, 
at the deeper levels of it always vaguely but indomitably posit existence in a world. They speak for a living organism floating and struggling in a foreign medium, and positing such existence and thereby claiming some degree of truth. Spirit exists and is incarnate, and this primordial claim to truth is valid, because in fact spirit lives only in animal organism, and these live only in the habitable world. Having thus stretched, as it were, the canvas of truth, or a real world to explore, the mind begins to lay on such colors as its palette supplies. These are mixed in the organs of sense. They are lighted up by the passions. Yet with this moral light and that sensuous texture, they are normally predicated of the object and used to define its nature, never its substantial nature, for that remains always the dynamic counterpart of the action which arouses attention and evokes faith. But the circumstantial nature of the object and the form it is to wear in human discourse. Here are two stages of conceptual illusion, dressing up conventionally the fundamental truth of human knowledge. There is really a world, and there are real objects in each case to be described. But the images of sense used to describe those objects are not found there, but are created by the organs of sense and the observer. And the syntax of thought by which these appearances, which in themselves are pure essences, are turned into predicates of substance, is a mere expedient of human logic. So that while we gain true acquaintance with the real world, and that we distinguish its parts and their relations up to a certain point, we conceive these realities fantastically, making units of them on the human scale and in human terms. Our ideas are accordingly only subjective signs, while we think them objective qualities, and the whole warp and woof of our knowledge is rhetorical, while we think it physically existent and constitutive of the world. The exuberance of nature stultifies and overwhelms any specific being that makes itself or is made the measure of all things, and the human mind in particular is doubly perplexed when it begins to discover on the one hand that things are not quite as they seem, and on the other hand that its own images and rhetoric are poetical. But an angry or despairing temper of criticism in either direction would be ill-considered. What is there wrong or paradoxical in the fact that the sensations and reactions of an animal must express directly his own nature, and only indirectly the nature of the forces affecting him? And what is there vain or scandalous in emotion, in original sensations, or in the poetic freedom of mind? Undoubtedly, the essential potentialities of spirit are not exhausted by a specifically human experience. An intellect cannot help aspiring to omniscience and to the knowledge of things as they are, and in practice. The conduct as well as the imagination of man stumbles and suffers rude shocks when vital presumptions are contradicted by events. There is accordingly something urgent about truth in our ideas, and something dangerous and ignominious in their falseness. But such urgency and danger touch not the inner rhetoric of thought, but only its practical symbolism and the concomitant action. We must not be misled by imagination. There is no likelihood and no need that, in a miraculous sense, imagination should be clairvoyant. All troubles and vehement skepticism, therefore, rests or ought to rest on economic considerations, the war against religion, the war against pictorial and logical thinking, is a commercial war. The poor, the hard-pressed, rebel against being taxed for such luxuries. They think mankind cannot afford to be human. Recent science, both in physics and psychology, has responded, perhaps unwittingly, to this commercial interest. It is proud of not being deceived, and of wasting no energy on superfluous ideas. Physics can be reduced to pointer readings psychology to the statistics of behavior. No doubt they can, for commercial purposes, and it may be convenient, 
and expert calculation to abstract from all other considerations. But suppose we were willing to use only mathematical equations and conceiving matter and the dynamic connection of all events. The rest of our experienced or imagined world would then be explicitly transferred to another sphere. Let us call it mind. And this variegated experience, not open to psychological science, which treats of behavior only, would become enormously important and, except for the mechanical or medical expert, alone familiar. Even that expert would continue to live in the human world, using his science only in occasional professional excursions beneath the surface of phenomena, and his scientific conception of the underlying forces or processes would be too tenuous, unlike mythology, to draw away his instinctive belief from the pictorial universe of the vulgar. His philosophy, if he stopped to frame one, would probably be empirical and idealistic. He would regard his science not as truer than appearances, but as an intellectual fiction based upon them and somehow serving to predict them. Only autobiography could be quite true. It is not, however, on the lines of autobiography that mankind conceives the world. Not literary psychology, but pictorial physics dominates the conventional mind. We walk abroad absorbed in a landscape or in picturesque episodes and street scenes. A philosophical critic might say that we were occupied with our own sensations and not with the truth of nature or of society. But though this may be his analysis, it is not our conviction. And even when we are reading history, poetry, or novels, what probably fills our minds is pictorial physics. Suppose I am thinking over the life of Napoleon. I make no attempt to recover his unrecoverable stream of ideas. Instead, I imagine his mother, his military college, his uniforms, his habits, his books, Toulon, and the Tuileries. I sprinkle over those material scenes a few recorded words of the hero. I imagine his life as I might have watched it, not as, in his inner man, he may have experienced it. Yet the scenes I evoke are, to some extent, the very scenes he witnessed and acted in. I actually relive a part of his experience in recalling some of the objects that surrounded him. Pictorial physics, or the human aspect of material things, thus forms the principal element possibly common to various minds, and we have no way of imagining other people's emotions save to imagine their predicaments. A curious compensation results in regard to truth and fiction. Nothing that exists can escape from the purview of truth and all fictions touch the truth, at least in this point, that they have in their day a psychological existence, so that a true history of fictions is conceivable. But conventional fictions touch the truth also in a technical way, which is more intimate. In the act of being repeated or communicated, they are named and defined. Their conventional essence becomes a standard essence in human discourse, which may be spoken of congruously or incongruously, truly or falsely, according to the accepted usage. And this is not merely a matter of language and social propriety, because when an essence is once clearly focused and distinguished in the mind, exactness in reproducing it, or fidelity in expanding it, excites a pleasant feeling of recognition and euphoria, whereas incompatible variants passing under the same name, become offensive and, as we say, false. Obviously, no essence is false to itself, but a violation of convention is false to the context, and expectations woven about standard essences in the public mind, that is, in the private mind when socially controlled. There is a vital discord, and the incongruous note that produces it is called a false note. The vital character of such discords and harmonies justifies a human trait which, at first sight, might seem scandalous to a moralist. 
invention, correctness, orthodoxy are far more intimately precious to mankind than truth. The world of things seems arid and alien compared with the inexhaustible world of talk, and a man will laugh at his mistakes about matters of fact, when shame will consume him all his life long if he has slipped into a fault of speech or of manners. Not merely to for social reasons, because other people may be laughing at him. The inner beauties of convention are glorious to develop, and its tissue painful to rend. The I mention music, rhetoric, and social ritual. Perhaps the speculative part of religion, pure myth, or metaphysics, or theology, will show the power of convention best, because here the inspiration is so potent that it overflows all barriers overcomes the judgment, and claims positive truth for its fictions. Not only in the maniac and the prophet, often at second hand, when social continent supplies the lack of physical sanction, and when types of religion, as of language and manners, become things to fight for and to be true to at the sacrifice of all other interests, especially that of truth. philosopher who has discovered his principles for himself may wear them with a good grace, but one who has adopted them from other people is likely to be a fanatic. Nothing infuriates a man more than to be contradicted in the conventions which he has learned with care, accepted on high authority, and made the center of all his thoughts. Not only are his proud views thereby cheated and mocked, but the fact that this precious orthodoxy was after all acquired and perhaps not altogether persuasive at first to the inner man doubles the alarm. The scoffer outside is not without a silent ally within, and the outrage is intolerable that the same world that once taught us all these difficult things and induced us to conform to them at a great secret sacrifice of our inclinations should now coolly proceed to teach us something different, require us to back our engine and to revise our affections, already so artificially constrained and elaborately stimulated. Our straitjacket has grown into the flesh, and we are ready to flay any man who would tear it from us. Not only do we regain our freedom with a sigh, we know too well that it will not be freedom, but only slavery to a new convention, probably more external and repulsive to our inner nature than were the older traditions. For if those traditions were wrong, it was chiefly because they were too spontaneous, too boldly human and conceited, and anything contrary to them is likely to be doubly contrary to the heart. All this usurpation of truth by convention is inevitable in a being as richly endowed physically as man is, so that his inner life is ready to breed world upon world, while at the same time he is so hard pressed by matter and by society that his imaginative fecundity is continually cut short, and he is compelled instead to attend to the hard facts. Hence all the disappointments of spirit. We are condemned to live dramatically in a world that is not dramatic. Even our direct perceptions make units of objects that are not units. We see creation and destruction where there is only continuity. Memory and reflection repeat this pathetic fallacy, taking experience for their object, where in fact everything is sketchy, where in fact everything is sketchy, evanescent, and ambiguous. Memory and reflection select, recompose, complete, and transform the past in the act of repainting it, interpolating miracles and insinuating motives that were never in the original experience but that seem now to clarify and explain it. This second fiction, mythical or intellectual, may serve in one way to penetrate beneath the veil of sense and render us responsive in poetry and religious symbolism to the deeper currents of nature. Convention in such cases, while filling the imagination with fables and dramas, may really adjust human feelings and actions to the truth, 
If mathematical science and violent abstraction traces the material movement of things with the greatest accuracy attainable by mind, perhaps religion and traditional precept may more poetically but more voluminously respond to the same movement insofar as it affects human happiness. Yet such harmony between convention and reality is always imperfect, and the hold that convention has on mankind is not at all proportional to its rational justification. The tight opinionated precept feels itself inevitably to be the center and judge of the universe, and the poor human soul walks in a dream through the paradise of truth. As a child might run blindly through a smiling garden, hugging a paper flower.